And welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. And we hope that uh, all is well with you and your loved ones and the people that you care about. Wasn't it a wonderful Memorial Day celebration last Monday? I I just really do appreciate the fact that we take time out to thank those who gave so much. We owe so much to so, so many of us owe so much to so few who were willing to lay down. You know, John says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We could, we could change that and say, for his family, for his country. And I just hope and pray that we'll kind of keep that. You know how I feel about holidays. They're great, but I, I wish they were more than one day, you know. I wish that we could appreciate those who serve us the first responders, the medical people, the law enforcement people. Uh, There are just so many people that uh, devote the rest of their life to us. And uh, I just really do appreciate their sacrifice and their willingness to serve. I want to announce this morning that not tomorrow, but the next week, Mayfair begins their vacation Bible school. Now, this is a real event. I mean, every year... About the second uh, week in, uh, in June, Mayfair has a wonderful vacation Bible school. And as you'll see, it is for those whose ages are 4 to 10. And uh, it, we, it begins at 9 a.m. next Monday. Now, the reason I'm talking about it this morning is because we want you to pre-register. Go online and pull up Mayfair Church, and uh, you can pre-register. We really do need to know this regarding the signs, you know, the sign for the classrooms and the refreshments, and it just really helps if everybody will register ahead of time. So please keep that in mind. This is one of the most exciting. We don't have a summer slump at Mayfair. We've always had a summer revival. We have a number of interns who come in and help with the college and the uh, high school and the middle school and even in the younger area. So the kids are so busy during the summer doing things they can't do during the winter, of course. So be sure, and uh, if you have children between 4 and 10 years old, they will love coming to Mayfair to this wonderful, I love to go in there in the morning at 9 o'clock. It is so loud. It is so exciting. The kids are there. Uh, They have dedicated Bible teachers and young people that care about them. They'll be watched, they'll be cared for, and they'll be taught. The Word of God. So please uh, go ahead and register if you have children between four, ages four through ten. And I know your children would get a blessing from it. Please remember that our services begin at Mayfair at nine o'clock on Sunday morning and also over at Central. Now I have two more Sundays with those good brethren. I preach Father's Day and then I preach the next Sunday in June, and then I'll be winding up my services with them. And I I don't know when I've enjoyed uh, preaching and and worshiping with brethren any more than I do with the Central Church in Athens, Alabama. Limestone County, the fastest growing county in Alabama right now. And so that's true. It looks like it's that true just across the country. So be sure to uh, come if you can. We begin at 9 o'clock at both services, in fact, and Sunday schools are uh, later on. So keep that in mind. 
The book of John in your Bible. Get your Bible. You know, this is, this is about the Word of God. It's not about me. It's not about Mayfair. It, it's really about God's Word. And it's been that way now for a long, long time. Open your Bibles to the 13th chapter of the book of John. You know, when someone wants to become a Christian, I, I have a plan. I have a way of, that I've used over the years, <clears throat> and it's worked out just beautifully. I say, okay, what we need to do, if you want to devote your life to the Lord, you want to become a child of God, let's study the book that was written for the purpose of building faith in, in you about the Lord. In other words, when you read this book and you see what story this book tells, and when you get to the end of it, you'll know he's what he says he was, and that is he, he is and was the Son of God. And that John says, that's the reason the book is written. You know, the purpose of the book was told in the last part instead of the first part. We usually, when we write something, we usually say, well, I'm writing you this letter because I want you to do such and such. John begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then that Word, verse 14, and that Word, that Logos, became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. Isn't that wonderful that we have this book? So when, we, when uh, someone wants to be a Christian, I, we sit down and we study the book of John. I don't want them taking my word for it. I want them to read it for himself. And so that's the reason, because over half the book, we'll begin with uh, chapter 13. It's kind of, it's the last seven days of the, of the life of Christ. I'm going to read you a statement in a moment that just kind of sets the, sets the stage for the rest of the book. Well, let's, let's go ahead and read it. Verse 1 of chapter 13. And it, just, it was just before the Passover. All right, listen to this. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. That's the way chapter 13 begins. Wow. Jesus knew it was time. Uh, this had been the plan from the beginning. You know, uh, I say, what would be the difference in our lives if we knew the time had come when we would leave this earth? And secondly, would we be going to the Father? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question, isn't it? Uh, would you live any differently if you knew when you were going to die? I think that's what we uh, understand about this matter of living. We want to live as long as we can. We don't know when we're going to die. Most of us don't, and we don't know how. And that presents a little bit of concern, and that's the reason in John 14... He tells these grown apostles, these grown men, these fishermen, these rough men uh, physically, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be broken hearted over this. If you believe in God, that, that's since you believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, I've, we've, we've worked now three and a half years. I've got to go back to the Father and the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and will guide you into all truth. And so John here is, if, if you're looking for a place to study, if you're looking for something to just thrill your soul, begin in the 13th chapter of John. I, I just stay here a lot because it's more, we, we talk about John 13 about the washing feet, you know, when he gets to the upper room and, and, and he wash, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But here, this is a book. If you have any doubts, if you have any qualms about who the Lord is, and there's a lot of questions about it now. I think more questions about who He is right now. I saw a sign the other day on the highway, Jesus is living. That's right. Jesus is living. He's not, his tomb is not uh, filled with the remains of someone who's passed away. His tomb, his tomb was empty. And he's gone back to the Father, and he intercedes on our behalf. So he's alive. His Word is alive, Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow. And quick, here's a, here's a kicker, and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is the only book in the world that does that. 
it condemns not only what we do, but tells us why we did it. And that's extremely important. And so I just, I just can't move away from this verse because it just, it just floods my soul with questions about my life and about hopefully about your life that Jesus knew the time had come. What would you do if you knew it? Would you do any different? Do you have any bridges? You have any bridges to burn? You have any things to correct? You have anything to make right? I've seen people get ready to die over my years of ministry. I have. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing because you want to, as the Lord told, as the prophet told the man in the Old Testament, set your house in order. Get your house ready to go. And so it says, and Jesus knew it was time had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. Listen to this. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. I just can't imagine uh, the, uh, how, much, how much meaning is in this. Having loved his own. This goes back to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1, 11, rather, when it says, And he came unto his own, his own family, his own nation, the Jewish nation, and they that were his own received him not. Now, that's a general statement. It's true of the family. We've talked about that before in Abundant Living, how that the Lord had such a struggle with his family. When at Mother's Day, we talked about on the cross, Jesus said, Behold thy mother. And he's talking to John. He wasn't talking to his brothers and sisters because they were gone. John somehow, some way, made his way to the cross at, as Christ was hanging there for six hours. And he wouldn't leave this world. We talked about this, didn't we? He, he wouldn't leave this earth until he made sure his mother was cared for. But then isn't it interesting that he gave him, her, excuse me, to someone who had followed him for years. John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And the Bible says, and from that day forward, John took her into his own. And so then this verse says, that having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Greater than, uh, uh, we, we went to uh, Gunnersville the other day, and Philip, my son, preaches there, and he preached on and honored the soldiers. And he said some of the most wonderful things because he pointed out that this, the verse I quoted a while ago, that greater love has no man than this man, a man lay down his life for his friend. Uh, that just didn't start with our soldiers. It was true of Jesus. Jesus was the first that we know of that laid down his life for a friend. There has always been a lot of fighting and a lot of killing, but it's with the enemy, not for someone that is your friend or your family member. You die for somebody else, and we have that happen in our country daily, I'm afraid, uh, by law enforcement or by the military who constantly defend. We, do, we don't know what's going on. We think we know what's going on everywhere, but we don't really. And I guess if we did, it would, it would really cause a great deal of concern. But he showed the full extent of his love. For God so loved the world. I think he said that earlier, didn't he? In the third chapter, in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so that's the reason this, this means so much to me. And then he talks, and when he had taken the meal, and it, uh, he goes up into the upper room. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and he was returning from God. Isn't that an interesting statement? He came from the Father, and he's going back to the Father. Now then, look. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, 
and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin. Notice John is an eyewitness of this now and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, you do not realize now that what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon said, replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not, not every one of you. For he knew that he was going to betray him and that he, and while he had said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, clothing and returned to the place. Do you understand what I've done for you? Do you, do you get the point here? Yes, teacher and, uh, and Lord, uh, and rightly so, for that is what, that is what I am. Now that I, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. For I am, I, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now here's verse 17. This is, this, this to me bails it all. That's the reason I love the Word of God. It, the Lord has a way of, and the Holy Spirit has a way of teaching us the point. Like in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God. If man had written that, he would have never gotten any further than that. He said, now what I mean by the beginning and what I mean by God. No, in the beginning God created, make from nothing, the heavens and the earth. And so now look what Jesus says in verse 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now let's just kind of pull that verse apart. It's interesting that the Lord appeals to us in knowledge, in facts, in commands, in examples. It, it's not just an emotional ride and you just float from one thing to another. But he said, I want you to know what you're doing. I want you to understand that, that it's important that you know the truth cognitively. I, I, I don't want robots. I want servants who understand the Lord and understand what it means to be a child of God. And I think I've tried on Abundant Living to get people back to the Bible. Let's get back to knowing God's will. John 8, 32, you know the verse, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And it just breaks my heart today that some tell others that you can't know the truth, that truth is whatever's truth to you. Well, that makes me the Lord, and I know better than that. So know what God's Word says. Do you believe that? Notice the examples in the book of Acts on how people became Christians. They were taught the Word of God. They didn't say, how do you feel? They didn't say, do you feel good? Do you, do you feel like you're saved? No, cognitively, I've got to know that Jesus taught a, the way of life. And it is a discipline. It is a so, excuse me, it is a subject that is like chemistry and math and, and history. It's God's Word. This is our textbook. And we must be willing to read the textbook in order to read. After, you know, I don't know how many thousands of times I've said on the, on, the, on the program that the book of Acts, the book of conversion that tells us what to do to be saved, is written on a sixth grade level. That's the reason we don't baptize babies. Because babies, number one, are not lost. Number two, babies can't believe. Of all things, number three, babies can't repent. 
And so we, we, we baptize people when we can teach them and they are old enough to understand the basic fundamental, the first principles of what it means to do. Look how quickly it was done in the book of Acts. Peter preaches and they said, uh, these men are drunk. Paul, Peter said, no, we're not. It's just the ninth hour of the day. We're not drunk. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel some five, six hundred years ago, that in the last days I will pour forth my spirit upon all flesh. And so then Peter preached unto him, the one you killed uh, 50 days ago was a son of God. This same Jesus, verse 36, this same Jesus whom you crucified hath become both Lord and Christ. So notice this very emotional time that Jesus got to the upper room and he found what I've said over the years. He found swollen heads and dirty feet. Swollen heads, why? Because they were arguing like they did a lot of the times about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. In fact, one mother came to him and said, make, make my son, my two boys, number one a man and number two man in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, lady, this is not going to happen. And he kind of called a huddle back. He said, you fellas come over here. This is verse 41, 42, 43. And he said, you fellas, let me tell you, you know, out in the Gentile world, when, when the person becomes a general, when the person becomes a CEO, when the person becomes in charge, then that means all these people serve him, that are under him. He's the boss. He said, in my kingdom, it's not going to be so. That he that would be the greatest among you will be servant of all. So then, it's not the people that serve us, it's the people that we serve in the name of the Lord. Why? Because that's what he did. He went about doing good. In Acts chapter 1, uh, Luke begins his second letter, <clears throat> and he says, A former treatise I wrote unto the old Theophilus of all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Doing what? Teach. And so then, it's, it's imperative that, you know, that's, that's what I say when I finish the book of John and I'm studying with somebody. I quote this verse. Now that you know it, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be, one translation says happy. And that's okay. That's an emotion that we feel after doing God's will, not before. And so he says, if you know it, then blessed are ye if you do it. And that's the reason then we go to the book of Acts and we study what they did to become child, children of God. <clears throat> so let's not fail to appreciate the fact that there's knowledge involved. And, and that's the reason he says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth cognitively, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Why? Because if you don't believe, why would you be baptized? It's a waste of time. And so here is a very, very interesting verse. And he says, now that you know it, in other words, do something about it. Uh, like in Acts twenty two sixteen, when Ananias said, why tarriest thou? <laughs> What are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so then there is knowledge involved. There is the need. Like in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, in verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples. That's what I'm preaching. I'm, I am speaking at a number of uh, places throughout the last Wednesday night. I was with the Gunnersville Church and enjoyed that very much. This coming week, I'll be with the Farley Church here in town. And what we're going to talk about is going making disciples in Huntsville. You know, we can get so excited about places around the world. And, and, and that's true. And I, I need to apply this to myself. I go to Cuba, you know, and I just, I can't wait to get the opportunity to preach and teach and talk to people about Jesus in Cuba. Am I doing it in Huntsville? I better. 
I better be making disciples by my life and by my willingness to uh, leave the example and teach when the door is open. And so then he says in Matthew 28, go make disciples. And then verse 19 he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things. Just bring it all under the umbrella of serving the Lord. I've got a lot to be. See, the Christian life is a journey. It's not something you do one time and then you're through with it. It's a way of maturing. It's a way of growing each way. Like Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So then he talks about if you know these things, then you will be blessed. Now go back and read Matthew 5, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and he begins with the Beatitudes, and he talks about the people that are blessed. Happy are they uh, that are uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Go back and look. And let's kind of think this morning about how we've been blessed and how these blessings come from the Lord, James 1, 17. And so he says, if you know it, and, and you will be blessed if you do it. Just do it. Like they said in, in, in the book of Acts and in other places. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I love this verse. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For inasmuch as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That is a wonderful verse. Thank you for watching this morning. We hope you have a good Lord's Day. And let me remind you of the Vacation Bible School that begins at Mayfair, not tomorrow, but the next week. But you can go in line, they, online. They really do want you to go online and register your child or children if they're ages 4 to 10. And they'll have a wonderful time. Thank you for watching. May God bless you is my prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord.